Now let's take a look at some typical cache parameters. Notice that caches range in size from 32K at the L1 level to 100 megabytes at the L4 level for those machines that have an L4. Main memory, on the other hand, tends to be between 4 and 32 gigabytes. It could be larger, but most systems have memory somewhere in that range. The distinguishing feature of the L1 cache is that it's split. That is, there are separate data and instruction caches so that they can be accessed in parallel at the same time. The L2 cache is unified. There's a single cache for instructions and data. The L3 cache is banked, which means that there are different addresses of the cache that are located in different parts of the chip. The L4 and main memory, of course, would be off chip. The access time ranges from two to three cycles for the L1 to 50 to 80 cycles for the L4, and main memory could be up to 400 cycles. It's certainly going to be at least 100 cycles. The implementation technology for L1 and L2 is SRAM, and below that, typically DRAM. So comparing centralized versus bank structure, what are some of the advantages of centralized? Well, the first is that movement of data between banks is simplified. But as far as we've covered in this class, the only time we've seen when data actually need to be moved was in a cache that was virtually indexed and tagged. When one process shares data with another process, and there's a processor switch between the two. Another advantage is that the interconnect between the L2 and the next level is simplified because it can be in one place. In a distributed cache, you'd have to have parts of the interconnect all over the chip. Now, what are some advantages of a banked structure? Well, a single tile can be designed and then stamped as many times as needed. So you can have the same kind of subsystem in many places on the chip. And that, of course, makes it easier to reuse across generations. Secondly, it's more feasible for a many core processor where you can't centralize the cache because the wire length would be too great you'd have too much of your chip area devoted to wires. Also, it would heat up certain areas of the chip more than others and therefore cause a cooling problem. Now, I have a few questions about inclusion properties. What kind of caches move a block from one level to another? Exclusive, because if a block is in one level, it can't be in other levels. Which kinds of caches propagate an eviction up from the L2 to the L1. Inclusive caches, because if a block disappears from one level, it has to disappear from higher levels. Which kinds of caches have to inform the L2 about a write to the L1? Inclusive caches, because if a write is made to the L1, then that same data needs to be included in the L2. In an inclusive cache, can L2 associativity be greater than L1 associativity? It certainly can, but it can't be less than L1 associativity, or you wouldn't have room in the set for the L2, in the L2 set, that is, for everything that might get evicted from the L1. Now we want to look at a diagram of what goes on in inclusive, exclusive, and nine caches. With an inclusive L2, if you have X and Y in the L1, and then, uh, and, uh, yeah, and then you evict a block from the L1 because it's inclusive, well, the block can still stay in the L2. If a block is evicted from the L2, however, it must also be evicted from the L1 because it can't be in the L1 but not the L2. On block Z, well, the Z gets copied up from the L2 to the L1 when it's referenced. Let's look at an exclusive L2 cache. Now, in the first case, we see blocks X and Y in the L1, which means they can't be in the L2. But after X gets evicted from the L1, well, then it goes down into the L2. Then after block Y is evicted from the L2, um, it, well, it can stay in the L1 because it can be in one cache or the other. 
But after a reference to block Z misses in the L1, it needs to be pulled up from the L2 and disappear from the L2 and then reside only in the L1. With a 9L2, we don't need to take any special action here, so X and Y are duplicated in both the L1 and the L2. Then block X is evicted from the L1 cache and it can stay in L2. Then block Y is evicted from the L2 cache, but it can stay in the L1. But what the diagram shows here is that somehow a Z magically comes up to reside in the L1, and that's just a typo. Z should not be in the L1 cache right here. However, there's, after there's a miss on block Z, then Z would come up from the L2 to be in the L1. So it should be here, but not there.